Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio, with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome back to Scouser Tommy's, the first one of the new season with with uh, Jay Reed and with me, Jim Boardman. It's it feels a while since the end of last season, but here we are, ahead of the new season now. Um, the players should just be about getting back off the holidays now and ready to start playing tomorrow. Oh, hang on a minute. No, they should have started playing a few weeks ago, shouldn't they? But yeah, that's how this season's begun, I think. It feels like we've had a load of testimonial games, a load of pre-season games. It's as if the players thought that we were... Um, I don't know, because there's a couple of old players in midfield. It was like a sort of Legends game or something. I don't know. The attitude hasn't been right. It's not been a great start. But you know what? It gives us something to moan about, doesn't it, Jay? Yeah, I love that more than a good moan. So I think you put it quite up there. Yeah, it was very pre-season. A lot of youngsters featured. Who, a lot of players who before probably wouldn't still be here. Players who, you know, getting bit part roles or starting games and whatever. So... And as we said just before we started recording, it kind of gives you more to talk about when things aren't going right. When things are going smoothly, all you just want to do is go, well, just get the next win on the board. And, mm-hmm. you know, the old cliche, we only think of the next game, but actually kind of dread the next game, which is a bit a bit wrong, even though it is Bournemouth. And, you know, I can't honestly say I'm wholeheartedly 100% confident. There's always that seed of doubt at the moment, which is stark contrast to where we was probably three or four months ago. Yeah, I think you get like, because like you play teams like, say, like when we were playing Fulham, and I thought to myself, well, when it was COVID and they'd first let some fans in, that was our kind of probably actually our only away game with fans for for like that big chunk of the season, because they were the only only part that hadn't got a local lockdown that coincided with us having a game so that some away fans could be there. And they made quite a bit of dinner and, and we lost. And it was almost as if we were, um, well, that was a bad season anyway, but it was almost as if we were sort of, undone by the loud crowds and you think so there's loads of games like that where you're playing playing teams where it's almost like the cup final they're well up for it they're going to be difficult then you think well you've got the big teams who like you know whether the big now or or just big rivals from old they really want to play against you they've got to, they're going to want to beat you and obviously you've got the real you know the really big teams over the top where people are fighting you hopefully for those top four spaces and, and maybe more and they're big games but then you think well <laughs> so in other words any game can be lost but I get what you're saying because it's more sort of my feeling normally before a game is look, don't take this for granted. Don't go into this thinking you've won just because it's Bournemouth, just because you've, you know, just because you're going to be up for it, just just because they stand the it doesn't matter. You know, you've not got to be complacent. You've still got to win this game. You don't win it by talking about it. You win it by doing things on the pitch. And you know, if you do that, you'll be fine. But I can't now get that bit into my head. It's still that kind of that whole negative thing that every game is going to be difficult and. I don't know, there just doesn't seem to be any fight in the team at the moment, which is why I sort of talked about testimonials in pre-season. It's just that that sort of, I don't know, there's not there's not been that attitude of we've got to go down right, we're going to go for the jugular now. Because there's loads of times last season where you see that we kind of messed about an hour of the game, we weren't really making any chances. Next thing you know, we concede on the counter, but then all of a sudden we start putting things together, we put them under pressure and generally we come back and get the result. But we didn't seem to have that kind of... I think we talked a lot last year about us not needing to go out of third or fourth gear. I don't know what gear we were in. We've been in this season, but I think the gearbox is knackered. I think we've been in reverse, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think we, we we often referenced gears last season as we were there discussing, and yeah, I think the whole engine needs a bit of a reboot. I think, you know, the oils ran dry. Um, <laughs> you know, the... the the belt's squeaking. We're probably, you know, putting a couple of second-hand parts on here and there, and it's just not really working, you know. And it it's concerning more than anything because I think we've sort of convinced ourselves that 
although we do need some, you know, new parts in there, we're probably not going to get them. We probably just have to, you know, batten it up, put the lid back down and, you know, hope for the best and see how far we can get down the road because um, I, don't, I just don't think that's what's going to happen in terms of a new player or, you know, uh, more new players because we're that, we're that used to the way we run at the moment. Um, if we did, it'd be a wholehearted surprise and, you know, it would give everyone a lift and, you know, we could be sat here in a week's time, you know, a win against Bournemouth, a win against Newcastle and a new lad in the door in midfield and all of a sudden things are all rosy in the garden once again. But, you know, I think we've probably been spoiled in what we've had on the Jürgen and especially over the last three or four years, some of the football we played, the, you know, the, the scintillating form, the batting teams away, as you say, we're getting out, not getting out of second or third gear. And, then, you know, is the reality checks kicked in. And, you know, the, the only consolation I'm taking going into the weekend and probably into next weekend is, are we going into a Merseyside derby as a six-point relegation battle here because we're <laughs> a point above them? <laughs> like the Blues in work, we're giving it out on the Tuesday morning when we stole in. They were like, ah, you know, you got beat by Manx and all that, all that business. And we we're like, yeah, but one, we're still above you. And two, when we play you next week, it's going to be a six-pointer, isn't it? And they were like, to be fair, it probably is because yeah. <laughs> we, we don't know where our next points are coming from and neither the day. So at least we're all in the same boat together. That's the thing, isn't it? Like we do talk about the old cliche, play one game at a time. And when when you're chasing a title, it's important to think that way because you don't want to you, you don't want to kind of count your chickens and all that sort of stuff. You want to you want to literally don't you know don't don't look so far ahead at the next thing that you've got to do that you end up tripping over whatever you're working on now and and stuff. But when it's at this stage of the season, those one game at a time things add up. If those one game at a time things are, are you're only picking up a point. You're not picking up any points. You, you're scraping three points somewhere or other. Then when you take one game at a time, this time, instead of looking back at what you've done and thinking, wow, look how far we've come, you're looking back and thinking, my God, are we only down here? Um, at least, I suppose at least the Blues, though. I mean, it's easy for them, isn't it, right now, what's going on? Because they're used to being down there. You know, we maybe they should be a bit more sympathetic to us because it's, you know, it's a weird experience for us compared to them. Um, no. it's, it's It is strange this season. I mean, I think I look back at Monday night last week when we played the Manx. It was to me, it was kind of like if football's fixed, which it isn't the way in this way. But if football was fixed, the script writers would be saying, "Right, Man United have got to win this one." You know that that's what they would have said. This this is how it would have been written. Man United would win it, and it just made me laugh in some ways. I mean, I can understand why they're angry about their owners, but before the match, they unveiled a, an expensive signing. They've they then beat us. They've had sort of half-hearted protests because they never all seem to get behind the protest. It's always just, you know, like a hardcore of the fans, you know, maybe the long-time fans and maybe even the local fans who are doing it. A lot of the other fans aren't that bothered. They just turn up for the game. They probably don't even know there is an issue with the owners. But in a, in a sort of bizarre way, beating us kind of derailed all their plans to kind of get rid of the Glazers because it's a lot harder. And it, it's kind of the reverse of what we're feeling like now. It's a lot harder for them to argue their corner when they just won. Like we we can sit here now as Liverpool fans and we we can talk for hours about what we change and what maybe we don't need to change what we've got to watch for and when there's problems you want to try and fix them in your own way you want to be involved in trying to fix them or come up with suggestions and they've walked away from that game and I'm starting to wonder what I mean I get it they've got some owners who can't take keep taking money out but as terms of if you didn't know about the money you you couldn't be upset with the way they beat us and the way that. They've still got players coming in. They've got a new manager. You know, they're, they're still, potentially, this could be a turnaround season for them. And in a way, we've given them a, a bit of a leg up on that, which is disappointing. Yeah, I think, well, just on them down the road, it's it's just spoiled brass behaviour, really, because, you know, they, they had it good for 20, 25 years on the Fergie and whatever. And, you know, they won everything. They they were able to walk into workplaces, school places, whatever, gloat. And now that things aren't going their way, and you know there's other teams on the block, such as the noisy neighbours across the other side of their city, and then you know was down to sixty two, have risen to to glory and reclaimed our perch once again. That they just don't like it, and they, they start throwing the toys out the pram. But you know, okay, the. There's an issue the way that their owners deal with the finances and whatever and so forth. And I think if if we were in their situation and looking at, you know, 
a, a £60 million pound midfielder role and a £50 million pound centre-half role and then and whatever else they've spent this year. I can't even think who else they've brought in, to be quite honest, but I know there's, there's those two. The one, I think the one issue that probably divides Liverpool fans more than anything is will the ownership spend money? Is it Do they not want to spend money or have they not got the money to spend? And it boils down, obviously, money is business and business is football. Um, if we were getting a couple of shiny new players in, all this trouble and strife that we're going through these last couple of weeks would we'll probably be, you know, oh, you know what, give it time, we'll get a new lad in and soon soon we'll pay it over the cracks and we, we'll, we'll get it sorted one way or the other. We're not going to be raising our pitchforks and, you know, lighting torches and stampeding down on field road because that's just not how we do it. We'll act in, you know, in other ways, such as obviously the walkouts over the ticket prices and stuff and the club. And the ownership quickly realised that's something they couldn't do. Um, but yeah, like you know, it, it does make you laugh that on one hand they're all stood there with the knowledge city scarves, but they're also <laughs> putting the new the new replica share that would probably cost them seventy eighty quid that they bought from various club shop club stop shops and stores and you know other other outlets that you know does find its way back to the club and you know inevitably if they say it finds its way back to the Glazers, so you know they're architects of their own down for an argument really but as I say if, if if we were spending cash like they were you know I don't think there'd be such a you know a huge divide but you know where would we be if there weren't something to moan about in football and you know Liverpool fans especially you're never going to please everyone if you if you do then you know you're probably doing something wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> because there's always an argument to be had one way or the other there's always one side of the fence that'll always be arguing with the other. There's never, you know, too many people sitting on top of the fence because they end up falling off one way or the other. So it's just we are where we are, as I say, results will dictate and in a week's time we could be having a completely different outlook. We could be, you know, six seventh in the table, six points under our belt going into the Merseyside Derby and we might have a new player through the door and, you know, it's a completely different outlook on football and life, but as it is, football controls our lives, so we can only live in the moment. And you know, there is the cliche that the next game is the most important. And the fact that I think that it's Anfield, um, again next week against Newcastle is is probably a little bit of a comfort blanket in the time that we probably need it most. Really, yeah, I think I think as well this season's kind of come because of the World Cup and because of the. Um... Well, I'm, I'm, whoever was at the FIFA at the time, making sure that the, the World Cup played it got played in Qatar in November in ridiculous heat means that this season started early. Us doing so well last season mean that means that we finished last season late. So in a lot of ways, I mean, I, I'm just just as a fan, I wasn't quite ready for the season to start again. It's like we just had the Champions League final. You sort of, you know, you kind of have a brew. Next thing you know. We're playing the Community Shield. It's the first bit of silver we're on offer already, and it just felt, felt. I mean, I think, you know, we were playing. We started the season in July, kind of thing, not pre-season. I don't class Community Shield really as pre-season. It's a kind of curtain raiser, but it's a, you know, it's a game that I think you would take relatively seriously, and that that's when it all gets going. And you know, it's just it just felt just felt too soon. But I think what's interesting is that. Although a lot of recent seasons, there's been no room for slip-ups for any team that wants to win the league. You've, the days of being able to lose six games in a season and draw six games in a season or something and still win the league, they, they seem to be long gone. But I think what what you can say is, OK, we've dropped, we've, we've picked up two, at the moment, at the time we're recording this, we've picked up two points from, from a possible nine. That's a lot of points we've dropped, but... If if you'd kind of if you'd spread them out between now and Christmas, you'd probably find other people had, had had have dropped points as well. You know, there's no, I'm not sure. We'll have to see how it is, but I think th- there's signs that maybe Man City aren't going to have it as easy as they thought. There's maybe a couple of other clubs can challenge them here and there, and maybe clubs aren't quite quite so scared of them as they used to be. There's other clubs that are sort of picking up, and maybe it's going to be an exciting season in the league. We'll we'll have to see, won't we? But you know, I think it's just. Um, you wish you need that win. We get that first win, 
I think we'll start feeling a lot better, a lot better. I just, my worry is like, I feel like right now we're talking about things about the start of the season. And if, if this changes and we just have a little bit of that and, you know, a bit more of the rubber, the green and stuff like that, we'll, you know, we'll start winning games because I feel like that's the kind of thing we were saying, like, so at other points in the last 20 years. And it was just, you know, it wasn't, we were nowhere near as good as we thought we were going to be and hope we were going to be. Yeah. I think Gags put a tweet out or I seen him mention it, possibly in the Discord chat the other day. Um, if we win our next five, I think it is. You know, we just want one for the moment. But if if we did win our next five games, for example, um, it'd be a, an identical start to what Man City had last season. You know, they didn't exactly, yeah, and and the year trophyless. So, you know, positive to be taken in in a world of negativity. But as you say, it, if we get that one under the belt, I think that that sets the ball rolling, and you know, it, it's not been ideal and. You, know, you don't want to stand there like banging the, the excuses drum because, you know, everybody gets injuries and stuff. But I think we just, when we get injuries, we seem to get them in big clumps in a very similar area of the pitch. So obviously we're missing like two key centre half, the lads who got us through all last season. No slight on Joe Gomez um, because he's probably one of the top centre halves in the country and probably shouldn't represent this country if it means anything, not to us, but. Uh, maybe yeah. to win. Um, you know, he's been Shanghai back in after probably a couple of games in the last six months, competitive action. So, you know, that was a tough one for him to come in on Monday. And you're missing, as I said, the, the two lads who were, were key to giving us, you know, a potential quadruple last year. Add to that, um, you know, bodies in the centre of the park. We all know we would like one in there or two in there or potentially three. It depends on your, your opinion of certain players. But we, we knew this. We've known it for, for years, um, the durability and availability of, of lads in there. And, you know, it doesn't take a genius to work out. The older things get, the less reliable they, they become. So, yeah. you know, allowing allowing things to age doesn't exactly benefit you in the long run. And then I think, you know, the top end of the pitch, we've had, a you know, an unfortunate situation with Darwin. We can we can touch on that one, but you know, Bobby still seems to be sipping tequila on a daily basis. Um, and Jota, I've not a clue what happened with him because it seems to be stemming back to those meaningless internationals after the end of the season with the Nations League or whatever they were for Portugal. And he turned up for pre-season, then he was gone, and then we don't know how long he was gone for. And it could have been the end of this month, and now it could be. A couple more weeks. It might be the international break in September. That we might not get them back though. So, as I say, it's it's in clumps. But what we're taking out, it's it's big quality. Like you can handle, you know, maybe one injury here or there in each line. But the fact that we're taking quality players out of every you know line of the pitch, it's it's going to have its effect one way or the other. And you know, the the lads who are probably turning up at Kirby every day. Uh, probably checking in on the physios. Are we any closer to having him back? And when how long is he gonna be? It's probably annoying them as much as it's annoying us really. So, you know, all they can do is is knuckle down and, and get on with it and go in and bear it because, you know, what other option have we really got? Because, you know, the window shuts in five days as we record now. But as I've said, we, we, we don't expect anyone. If it is it'll be a bonus. But for now, this is where the end the corners, they say. Yeah, I mean, it feels like if, if we're going to get anyone in now, it almost feels like it'd be one of those kind of players that, that we bring in as a kind of potential backup who might not even get even on the bench. But it's a kind of, if we really do, you know, if we have a couple more injuries in midfield, we will have no one to play. It's not even like we can, um, it's not like when we had, we've, we've got centre-backs, we're, we're running out of centre-backs, so we can't, but running out of midfielders, we can't use midfielders to help out at the back. So, you know, I think if we were going to spend money, it feels like it would be more like one of those. You get a player maybe on a on a loan or maybe on a on a not a too bad a, not, not too bad a contract, not too bad a transfer fee, and then you're probably going to sell him in twelve months for roughly what you paid for him. And it's just it's just you know shame for the player who comes in because he might never get to play. But you don't know because you just you just try and be on the safe side. And you sometimes wonder with them whether you'd just be better off trying some of the young kids, but. Klopp and, and his team know better than any of us where they're at in the development. Are they ready to step up? But again, the the other issue with having 
young ones stepping up is it's great if you like full strength team apart from one position a young lad steps in everybody will look after him but at the minute there's no to know there's no stability from front to back i mean even even in the goalkeeping situation we've got we've okay we've got Alisson there but behind him there's, there's injuries you've got centre backs not we've not had the same partnership yet at centre back um I know Robbie Robbo's got a bit of competition perhaps in his position there's none for Trent really at the moment it's and that's no not with all due respect to Joe Gomez I think he's more centre back than full back and you know, and as you said as well, he's, he's still a bit, a bit rusty. I'm not necessarily thinking he's the kind of person that would keep Trent on his toes if he's having a bad game. And you just keep going, going through like that. I think as well. I think one thing that's interesting is all last season it was all the talk was about Salah and whether his contract would be renewed or not. And you know, now it's easy to look back and think, yeah, it was probably always going to be renewed. It was just a case of dotting a few I's and crossing a few T's. But meanwhile, Sadio Mane was basically sorting himself out with a move away. No no hard feelings. And I think at times Mane was almost like, he was very underrated, very underappreciated because he kind of ended up in the shadow of, of Salah sometimes. You know, he kind of ended up, in, you know, the presence of Salah was so good, especially at his best, that we kind of didn't really appreciate Mane as much as maybe we should have done. And, it makes you wonder now is how much of it's down to like missing him because it's not just about getting goals in the back of the net with players like him. It's far more that he does, and he's, you're wondering is that as good as Lucy as is overall for a team. Bobby's not back to his best. Are we are we losing? You know, we're we missing that as well. So we've talked about the centre backs and the midfield, but you know, are we missing that? And obviously, as you just mentioned as well with Nunez, we haven't got the chance to see yet what difference he might have made. Yeah, I think. You know, it doesn't help that Bayern Munich are swatting teams aside and in the Bundesliga three games in they got a plus goal difference of thirteen, you know. It, <laughs> it, it doesn't it doesn't help seeing that. But I think what what we, we will get now is what a, a similar thing to Ginny Wine I think in the year that you realise he's gone, we could actually appreciate the lad more uh, for what he did for us during the time. I think um well you know, sections of the fan base when Wayne Alden was here were a bit undecided what what he actually did as as benefit to the team. But when Jurgen Klopp described him as the lungs of the team, and you know, we probably ran out of breath towards the end of the season and didn't get quite over the line in a couple of competitions we would have loved to. Would them lungs have just you know helped us just get there? It, it's all hands that you never know. And even you know, at this point in time, three games into the season. I don't think personally we ever did replace Ginny Wijnaldum. and other people will have their own opinion on that. But for a lad who was constantly available and gave us all, no matter where he was asked to play, you can say exactly the same about Sadio Mane. Left wing, right wing, down the middle, off a striker. If you asked him to play left back, well, he probably did actually in, in most games appear at left back from time yeah. to time with Robbo bombed forward. Um, because he had the engine and, the, and the, the tactical awareness to do it. Um, and I think, you know, it's easy to point fingers now and say, oh, you've lost money, that, that's, that's your downfall. But, you know, if things were going swimmingly, then we wouldn't. But we would still, across the season, appreciate the fact of what he did for us as a, as a team, as a player. Um, and obviously, good luck to him. He, he's, he's, he's conquered it all at Liverpool and he earned the right to, you know, choose his next destination and and walk off handsomely. I just wish, had we known that he was doing this and obviously moving on to pastures new, I think just the, the humility of the guy, he probably didn't want a big fuss and, you know, the old champion's wall plaque that Divock Origi got, but to have seen him on the last day of the season and appreciate all he had done for the club would, would have been nice to, to show our, our respect to him because... You know, he, he fully deserves admiration from every every corner of Anfield and every Liverpool fan across the globe. And maybe, you know, the Champions League might throw up a, an opportunity to do that across this season. Um, but I, th- I think we'll, we'll be OK with Lewis Diaz. It, it, it may take time, but I don't think we've signed a dud in him. And, you know, with with Darwin Nunes, the, the early signs are raw. Um, but I think, you know, we probably didn't see Sadio Mane four or five years down the line playing down the middle and banging in 15, 16 goals for us in a, in a centre-forward role. And 
I don't think we'll we'll struggle too much with Darwin. I think you know the it's a different type of player, but once he gets his head under control, he's a young lad. He'll learn. I think the last two weeks on the training ground have probably been the hardest two weeks of his career in terms of you know top level football. Um, sitting and probably playing and not being able to do anything about it and probably also being drilled mentally on, on what's about to come um, because as the first game happens to be back for him it will be the derby and you know when we're a week away from that but he's in for a rude awakening if he thinks he can just go in and you know bash people about and answer around he's got to do it in a different manner than the last Uruguayan we had took plenty of hits and knocks and you know, the way he answered his critics didn't seem too bad for us in the end. No, no, I think that's it. I think where, where Suarez was so good was if he got if he got injured, he didn't, I mean, he didn't dive as much as people used to make out he did. He, he, the times I've seen him almost trying to defy gravity, Suarez, rather than go down because he knew he could somehow ride that challenge, if you like, and get back up and just get, get a, it was, he just wanted to score. He wasn't interested in winning a penalty. He would. He's definitely the kind of player that would rather score than than, than win a pen. Rather have a go at goal because he was so full of confidence. And I think, I think when Darwin realises that, you know, players are going to try and have a go at you. Players are going to try and nibble at you. Players are going to try and get you, you know, sight you out, whatever, whatever phrase you want to use. It's sledging if it's cricket and stuff like that. They're gonna they're gonna keep doing that to him, and he know, and he'll know that. And I think you're right. Sitting out for three games, watching it happen, he'll be able to see it. Referees over here are different, maybe to what he's used to the the way the game's played over here. It's different. It's you know we all let's not give refs any more mention than we just have. Actually, they have enough attention, but the crap basically. And you know he'll learn in future that when someone's having a little go at you like that, don't don't. Don't fall for it, and if anything, if you know, play them at their own game. You know, let let them be the ones that that you know, let them be the ones that look like the the perpetrator of the act rather than you for retaliating. So I I think he will learn, and I think I think as well. What's I think what's refreshing or maybe reassuring is like you Liverpool under Klopp have made mistakes, but Liverpool under Klopp have learned from the mistakes as a team, as a club, as individuals, all the way through all the way through this this sort of era. And I don't think Darwin's going to be any different. I think he's going to he's going to definitely learn from this. He's going to be a different player. He, he may well get more red cards, and that a lot of that's going to be his his passion. But I think he'll learn just to be a little bit smarter and a little bit, you know, more sort of streetwise in terms of how people get away with stuff in this league. And you know, I think maybe I'll realize he's not going to get a lot of protection. You know, players are going to be able to take chunks out of him all through the game. But I think he's big lad. He'll you know he's strong enough to take that and. You know, we we used to love Luis Suarez and the way he played, and I just think we're going to be the same with Darwin. They sort of we'll grow to love him very, very quickly. There's always already great signs. Disappointing what happened, but you know what? I I do really think he'll bounce back. I I think what we've got in in these <clears> type of football is the likes of you know Luis Suarez of the past and Darwin and Luis Diaz and even Mane and Salah to, to the same respect. They they come from hard upbringings, and you know with us. People of Liverpool have always had it, you know. We're, yeah. we're not going to win your mom, but we know what it's like to work hard. We know what it's like to be, you know, looked down upon and, you know, not be given an easy ride in life and having to work and battle for for your next paycheck, for your next meal, for your next, you know, bit of glory, bit of success. And at the end of the day, if you've if you've got into the field to play in a red shirt and if you give a hundred percent, no matter you know what the outcome you'll be appreciated for that and I think what that's what you get with these these lads who come from Latin and South America and also from Africa where you know they, they're not as privileged as, as other countries in the world they're not as you know us in the north and in Liverpool are not as privileged as those who live in the south of England it's just a it's a known fact it's just the way it is but we just knuckle down and, and get on with it and you know, bringing it, you know, full circle back back to Monday, um, and in the, in the midfield with Milner and Henderson, I think, you know, the, the quality might not have been there, but Milner, he wasn't, he wasn't for one of trying. He was given everything he could, and if he just, you know, his, his age and his ability means that he can't quite do things, then unfortunately, that's that's just on the fact of how he is and the ages and his body, but. He was given all for the shirt, and he was a couple of players um, 
across the team who who didn't look like they were giving it all and seemed, you know, to maybe not hide but not want to, you know, go the extra yard and you know, even even the young lad Harvey Elliott it weren't coming off for him, he looked a bit lost, but he was never for one of trying. And Liverpool fans will always appreciate that and, and we've had a lot of duds in the past, but there's also players who've came in and they knuckle down and if they give hundred and ten percent every single week, eventually things will start going right for them and it's then that they feel so proud and rewarded and that's usually the foreign lads or whatever who come in and say, well, this is why I love Liverpool because they always stuck with me. If I if I put my, my heart on the line and give them everything, they give it back and that's what makes a special connection between us and us and the players and other clubs and their players just, you know, it paychecks and turn up and you know you clap them for ninety minutes or whatever, but then you're also quick to abuse them, and that's just not how we how we do no. things around here. I find it mad. I do. I still find it crazy how many of our players get booed because they used to play for that club and then they left for another club, and especially with okay, we can't say looking at the league table now, but they left for a bigger club or a you know a club where they've got more chance of winning things. You know, ignore the league table at the moment, but that. That to me is like a, a career move they've made, and they must still have fondness for that club that was like that helped them to get to that situation and you know, gave them the chance of something. And they'll never forget that club, and they'll always they'll always have a special affection for that club unless you start booing them all the time. And we've done it with hardly any players all the time. I've been a Liverpool fan. There's there's probably not even you probably can't even count. You probably you can probably count on the fingers of one hand to eat at the most and have room left for the number of players we've really given stick to when they've come back. You know, obviously Raheem Sterling's one of them. We know why because of how he left. Um, Torres maybe a little bit, but even then it wasn't unilateral dislike of him. We kind of understood that there was a lot of stuff going on at the club at the time, and he he almost sort of I wouldn't say he had no option, but you can understand why he took the option he did. And you know, we can go on through loads of plays like that, but no, we we. We welcome these plays, we embrace them, we and I think it's the thing about the city, like you say, that we don't begrudge people doing well for themselves because we're glad they have, you know, and we and we always think that if that was me, I'd be you know, I'd be wanting to help people out and things and, and that's what happens so often. You know, you get people who do well for themselves and they're always putting so much more back as well. You know, they put plenty back. They're not they're not sort of aloof and thinking, all oh, right, I'm better than these now because I've done well for myself. I, there are the odd few. I mean, there's a few Tory MPs who come from Liverpool that have kind of done that. But on the whole, no. You know, you speak to any scouser who's living nowadays down in London and they're still the same person and they're still the same attitude and they still got that same sort of feeling about community and stuff. And often they're almost kind of kicking off their own mini communities where they live and kind of sharing those values and getting other people to join them in those values. And, you know, may, maybe it happens more in the country than we realise, but we're, we're proud of being like that in these parts, I think. And, you know, it's not been an easy place to live for a lot of people for a long time. There's so much horror. I mean, this is the place where Winston Churchill sent, um, sent the army to try and quell a strike, you know, and people got shot by Winston Churchill, the hero. And there's all sorts of stuff like that goes on that you don't hear about from the the sort of um, the people who just want to paint a great picture of how great Britain has always been. It hasn't been great. It's hardly ever been great. Um, there's been some great people in it, but it's hardly ever been great. And it's no wonder, no wonder we brew the national anthem, which we will continue to do as long as we're treated as we are. Um, yeah, I mean, we're having a rant again, aren't we now? But it's this is, as you say, though, that leads us back to it again. That I think. If we're looking at the transfer window now, and you're looking before the next transfer window, you're looking at any point in time at players, what you do not want to do is bring anyone in that doesn't fit, that isn't right, hasn't got the right attitude to be part of this club. And I think that's definitely the two main qualities we look for in a player. Can they play in, 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 in the way that we want them to play, in the role we want them to do? Will they fit in? And I think, on the whole, we always find players who will fit in and whatever the skill base or the the skill set or whatever else, they're the right minds, the right personalities, and you know I do think Nunes is one of them. Yeah, I, I, I mean you can say much more than that. Like did the old no dickhead policy? I think it was Milner who uh, put it <laughs> in his book. Like, but it's true, and you know if if the people of Liverpool, the fans of the club, and just the people of the city. Won't stand for any, you know, dickheads and any any sort of misbehaviour. You know, anyone, as you say, getting above the station and thinking that they're the best than what they are. 
they, they, they just don't stand for it. And, you know, at the moment, as we speak, you know, there's been a bit of bad news around the city in terms of oh, yeah. a co- couple of shootings and stuff like that. But what it has done, it, it, it's united a lot of the a lot of the city and the people, the influential figures, as you want, might want to label them, you know, like celebrities or ex-footballers and stuff like that. And it's all the same message. Like, this needs to stop. Obviously, there's... There's a lot of crime all over the UK, all over the world. It, it'll never truly ever be stopped and, and ridden of. But right now, we just seem to be going through a really tough time in control and what's going on in the streets and stuff like that. But to bring you again back to football, we unite as one and we don't want that happening. Like We all know if, if we run as a happy family, then then that's good enough. You know, it might not be getting the best outcome, but if we're all putting that everything in, 100%, every single player in the red shirt is, is 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 going out on that pitch and is coming off there, barely walking. Like, we've seen Lewis Diaz a couple of times last year. He ran that much that he could barely walk off the pitch, and, and that'll do, because at the end of the day, we know it'll eventually, it'll eventually come good for you. Um, so... You know the the lads we brought in Darwin, as we said again, it, it will work for them because we can see maybe it's just over eagerness, over passion. You know his history and his heritage, where he came from, and he's in a new club, a new city, a new country. He wants to impress so much, and I think once he starts getting a couple of goals in the back of the net, and you know the first one at Anfield will probably be a big one. That's maybe a potential reason why he was so amped up that night because. There was a video going round of him and Anderson tip for tat all night, and I, for the most part, he was doing the right thing. And I think you know it's just probably got too much for him. He's too hyped up, and it's one thing too many. Um, but there's enough lads in the in the dressing room and the management team and the coaching staff that they, they'll harness that. And I think once he does get you know one or two goals under his belt at Anfield, especially. The shoulders will drop. He'll become a bit more relaxed. Things will start becoming more natural, and then we do we'll start to see the best of him because it's certainly there. I think if if you asked anyone who watched the two games against Benfica last season, he, he was a shining light. And you know, if if Van Dijk saying this lad was a handful, there's not many people who you know do make games a handful for him. So we all know it'll happen. It again, it's it's just a little bit of patience is needed, but. Uh, have we really got the patience at the moment? I think come five o'clock Saturday afternoon, if we've got three points on the board, a clean sheet and a couple of goals, everyone, as I say, with the, with the shoulders will start to relax and feel a little bit more at ease. It's only a small step, but we've got to go in the right direction slowly. Yeah, I think I remember last year when, whatever time of year it was, like it was actually this year, I suppose, we, we were written off. We were never going to be in the league title race now. It was sort of like Christmas time, January time, wherever. Too far behind now. We've lost too many games. And, and in the end, in a way, what happened was we did so well. We did so well recovering from that that we kind of maybe did partly knacker ourselves out for this season because we were just, just too short to be able to just didn't quite have enough time to win the league. We just sort of, I think, I honestly think that's more or less what it was. Maybe one more weekend we'd have done it. It was that It was that close, but we didn't do it. So we have to move on now. We have to think about this season, but it's it's that thing. It's just that, you know, don't be despondent about where you are in the league at this stage in the season. Years ago, they never even bothered to make a league table. They wouldn't even print a league table in the paper until you'd played maybe four or five games because they were just, they didn't really mean anything. You know, there's, it was just a quick glance at who's lost the game so far. And so far, there's not many teams that can say they've not dropped points. I think, are Arsenal the only team? 100%. And not Arsenal being Arsenal, I don't... Maybe maybe this is their season, but Arsenal being Arsenal in recent years, that's not that's going to be something they're looking back on in six months as a, as a fond, distant memory, isn't it, the way they tend to be? Um, so, anyway, let's just think about... Um, just thinking about when you were saying then about personalities and stuff in, in the clubs and I was thinking about the kind of plays that would you'd never ever feel could could have fitted at Liverpool. Like I could never imagine a John Terry playing at Liverpool. I could never imagine a Ronaldo Cristiano Ronaldo playing at Liverpool. I could never manage uh, you know, n- never imagine loads of plays like that playing at Liverpool. Like Frank Lampard, he just doesn't seem he's not the kind of player that would play at Liverpool and it's odd. It's so odd that he's actually got a job in Liverpool and 
from your experiences so far, is there any... Um, I get the feeling, I don't know about you, but the Blues aren't as sure about this um, Tory boy as they were now. Yeah, it seems to have changed <laughs> as quickly as our optimism for the start of the season and, the you know, the community shield and that's it. You know, we've, we've set ourselves a marker and the league title and domination and all this business. Um, the Ev were, you know, they were going for, you know, solid mid-table and then we'll build on this and we'll challenge for Europe in a couple of years. All of a sudden, it's well, you know, it's just the same as long as we stay up. And I was like, I know we've had a little bit of a bad start, but you know, three, three games in, and you're already talking about like, are you going to stay up? And you know, Flash Gordon, who can't seem to stay off more, more than the floor than he can. Is he <laughs> is he coming? Is he going? Like, you know, I think some ludicrous crow Frank Frank said earlier on today that he's worth more than sixty million. If he's worth more than sixty million. I'm going to lace my boots back up and I'm getting back on the football pitch because I'll get a few grand for me and I've not played football for about four years. Um, <laughs> I, they're, they're just delusional, but I think they, they, they know if they sell them, they're probably not going to replace them. And and that's the fear, I think, with most of them is like they, they've lost, you know, the dancing pigeon in Richarlison and he was the, <laughs> the, the hero for them, wasn't he? And, all of a sudden, as soon as the offer was on the table for him to go to a bigger and better club, he he, he jumped on the, the Virgin train and we went straight down to London. But th- there's no real positive signs for them. And, you know, the only thing they've got is there is some sort of stadium being built on the waterfront and being told it's not just the sandpit anymore. But right. their, their optimism has, has quickly waned a lot faster than ours. And the, the irony that Frank, you know, it probably deep down inside couldn't wish him a worse city to actually be working in and players trade. I'm 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 not convinced he lives here. I'm sure he probably lives somewhere in the, the leafy Cheshire suburbs where like the United oh lads all live and, and drives his way in every day and quickly speeds off down the motorway as soon as he can. Um I'm not sure if things don't go right over the next couple of games and the derbies next week and stuff, um how far away are we from the sprayed bed sheets? Probably not too far, I don't think. Oh god, yeah. Yeah, if you need any bed sheets, like get yourself down the shop now because they're all gonna be gone soon. Yeah. Or white, if you need any bed sheets and the uh, black spray paint from B and Q, they'll be they'll be flying off the shelves, I think, if, if things don't go right for them in the next few weeks. Oh, it's funny. I love some of the banners you see though with protests. There was one one of the Manx had one as well, and they just like I can't remember what it said now, but they just run out of room. So they'd like they got this really great message to send and then they ran out of room and it was all like really squashed up at the end and they, they hadn't even, it just messed it up. I just love, love that. My, my favourite protest banners of all though were, um, was it Chelsea when they were holding up pieces of A4 paper that they'd written a protest message on which just tickled me so much because I mean, I mean that was good for them. That was quite that was quite a big improvisation for them because they normally used to get the plastic flag sanded to them free, aren't they? But you know, that was, that was quite ingenious for them but um yeah, and I think as far as protests go, you know, when we were protesting about our owners, we were protesting about owners, and I'm talking about Hicks and Gillette, properly protesting because they were basically going to kill the club. It wasn't a case of they were going to make the club struggle to compete against someone with loads of oil money. It was a case of they were going to kill the club. It would not exist anymore. And that, to me, is a massive difference to what the United fans have been complaining about because really, as you say, it's spoilt brat syndrome. Now the lad next door's got a load of money because he's, you know, they've won the lottery, whatever. They've come into loads of money and now he's not the 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 rich boy on the streets anymore and he's crying about it. That's what that's what it comes across to me as with them. And I think, you know, the longer the longer the longer it goes on, the more I'll laugh about it, to be quite honest. Cause I think as much as like Everton, they they build up resentments amongst themselves. They get they get this sort of at the moment, it's all like how great it was that we avoided relegation and we made the dog get paraded through the crowds and all the rest of it. You know, great moments and great memories. But they'll be moaning again soon and they'll just start fighting amongst themselves, you know, verbally. They'll be on each other's backs. The players will be so nervous. And I think, you know, it's the same with, with the Manx at Old Trafford. If they hadn't paraded that play before the game, if we'd have got an early goal, that atmosphere would have been would have been quite poisonous, apart from the... Well, half the fans are the, the tourist type fans that they definitely have, and I'm not having to go at anyone who travels afar to come to Anfield. I think there's a certain type of fan at Man United that is literally just they don't understand what football's all about exactly. It's just about being 
showing off to the mates, isn't it? So I think we 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 at Anfield. I know we we keep sort of boasting about ourselves, though. But I'd hate to support anyone else. I'd hate to be a fan of anybody else because I just feel like this is this is me, and that means through thick and thin. And you can use a made up Shankly quote that was around for a while, or you can just make up one of your own. But we've got to stay behind the team, whatever happens. And if you're at the ground, it's so important that you don't start mouthing off at the first sign of trouble. You know, you just got to kind of be be supportive and critical, not sort of nasty and critical, because otherwise you will sound like a blue. Yeah, that's one of the worst things in the world to sound like a blue nose, start booing and stuff like that. It's just. It's just not how we behave, and there's a there's a famous like saying like no one do you all hate us, and it's for the right <laughs> reasons of like just the way we operate as as a, as a club and as a fan base. Like we just seem to do things the right way, and all of a sudden songs we come up with, things we do when we go abroad, taking flags everywhere and stuff like that. It's all replicated and copied, or tries to be replicated and copied by by whoever else that you can. Bother to do it. I mean, like we take flags with us. Man City take them to cover seats. That's as that's as far as their flag parade goes. Um, <laughs> but I, it's just not not our type of you know way of l- looking after the Reds and, and supporting them. And I think if there will be a, there will inevitably a few idiots in the ground tomorrow who will be booing and will be shouting from the first minute, get him off, or you know tut on and kicking off a, you know the, the first sign of a loose ball there'd be a very small minority and there's probably enough people sensible people around them if, if someone's carrying on like someone else like sit down behave yourself get behind them if you're not going to get behind them then get out the door because you know there's, there's thousands and thousands of fans who would do anything to be in that ground tomorrow um, as you say wherever you are around the world there's people who make pilgrimages to, to Anfield and we're lucky that we live local and, you know, know enough people to get tickets on a regular basis if we want them. Um, you know, there's, there's probably people who listen to AI who've never been to Anfield who may never ever get to Anfield. Um, and that would be their absolute dream just to be there for one game only. And you, you see people going and all they want to do is be angry and, and abuse the players and, you know, not get behind the team. Well, that's a, that's a waste of a ticket because you know if you want to do that, go and sit in your own back room and do it. At least you know you're not making the people around you who've paid the hard their money their pleasurable experience unpleasurable by you know standing up and ranting and raving. So I don't think it'd be like that. I think you, what you would get if we've got to get the first goal, a clean sheet would be lovely because this nasty habit of going one nil down in games like. You know the Asian Beckham better markers of handicap betting have won a one goal lead to the opposition. You know, have we got some sort of sick fantasy where we want to keep going <laughs> one goal down and then trying to battle back in games? But it it will just ease a lot of the you know the the angst and the tension and you know a nice comfortable win is is all we we really require. It might not be that. It might be a horrible one nil. Might be a two one or something like that and type. But you know, if if we had our own preference, I think a nice comfortable win would be desired. But three points is probably most important. Sometimes you say you know the performances is is is, is the key thing, and I think it was that was the the situation with Crystal Palace, obviously. We touched on on Darwin losing his head, and we went down to ten men. But from the highlights of seeing that game, I didn't make it due to work reasons. But we we were a lot better than them, and we created a hell of a lot. We just you know couldn't get it over the line, and at least coming out of that game, we had positives to say. You know, well the, the signs were there that we are creating, and the performance was good. It just didn't go our way. The rubber, the green, the referee, or whatever, so on and so forth. But what happened on Monday was was unacceptable and I've I've said before um, on a previous podcast this week that I don't think I've seen us play as bad as that since the 6-1 against Stoke and that that was a low point and you know that was the end of the Rodgers era in effect obviously he carried on for a couple of months but the club was going in in a certain direction at that point that it's not going in now it's just you know circumstances may lead to you know players being unavailable but I don't think we've hit that rock bottom 
since you know that game of of a performance level. Um, and I think we know since then, you know, Everton's been on an upward trajectory. So where we are now, it's it, it, yeah, the only way is back up and. No, no, no better to do it than than a few goals on Anfield. Yeah, I mean we still got to play City twice. You know what I mean? We still, you know, we could take six points off them if we play to our best. We've already beaten them once this season in the, in the Community Stroke Charity Shield, whatever you want to call it. We've there's a, there's a long season ahead, and it's there are players missing. And I think one of the guys we we, we talked about on here, I've talked about it on Raw so often, is that kind of telepathy that we've had in our team where. They kind of know what each other's going to do, and they know what each other, each other, all the teammates are thinking. And you can't have that kind of thing if you're all if there's a lot of chopping and changing having to be done. I mean, I don't know how often things have been changed late on in training. You know, we might be thinking on a Thursday, this is the lineup we're going to have on Saturday, and then by Friday morning it's gone. And there's like, okay, we we can adapt a little bit, but you know, it's all as you say, we're playing with older players and all the rest of it. It's it's got to get better, and I think. We just got to be behind him, and I think I don't know about you. I mean, and and I, I know a lot of people, and and will say this that this last few years with Liverpool, there's been a, a lot of a lot of shit going on in people's lives, a lot of things to get you down. There's even now this kind of stuff going on that can get you down in the real world. And I've always said football's that big distraction that gets away gets you away from all that, and it either gives you something else to moan about instead of real life things because you you know just get it all off your chest. It's only football, really. No so what what anyone else says, it is still only football. It's the thing that distracts you. You know what? They they've made us so happy the last few years. I think you know this is this is us. This is what we'll do as as a fan base. Now we'll make them happy. We'll show them we're still with them. You know we, we we'll we'll pay you back now. All the happiness you've given us, we're we're there for you. We'll help you through this. We're all in it. We're all yeah. Well, it's kind of thing of Tory. So we are all in it together though. We're all we're all one. The twelfth man, whatever you want to call it, and we yeah definitely 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 going to improve. Another thing that's happened recently is the Champions League draw, which we were having a little chat about before we came on, which, um, funnily enough, has pitched us against another another team from from this island, um, not from this country in a football sense, because they're from Scotland. But, yeah, there's um, Rangers in our group in the Champions League. What do you make of that? Is that going to be one of those games that we could, well, two of those games that we could not really enjoy, or is that... Is, are we going to see what the real gulf is between the two leagues or what? Uh, I openly said, I think on Twitter, that I wanted one of the old firm. Um, yeah. I don't go to the away games because it's a closed shop in terms of getting tickets, but I know people who do and, you know, they want to go to new places. We've not played Rangers in a competitive game, so technically it's a new place, even though it's, you know, a few yeah. hours of the most way to Scotland. Um Lads, very pleased with the trip to Amsterdam for for various reasons. Not so keen on the trip to Napoli for the obvious reasons. Mm. Um, but I just wanted one of the old firm because, well, they're both in it. So, you know, it's very rare that you do get them in in the Champions League these days. They're more accustomed to the Europa League at their level. But just watching from afar, like the atmospheres they, they generate in their stadiums, especially on European nights, it's it's that something special. It's what you know people write about the famous European nights at Anfield and over the last five, six years Ibrox has been bouncing really, like they've driven home results that you just didn't think was going to happen and I just think like, it would be a good good blend of of games in terms of you know, the, the passion and what the fans will bring and you know, there should be an inevitable quality in golf and class between the two teams but you just never know the power of Anfield, the power of Ibrox, and yeah, it, Celtic would have been ideal, you know, given mm. our you know connections with Ireland and the whole yeah. political aspect. We won't delve into it too much. I think what what is going to be very interesting um, is you know Rangers openly loyalist and royalist, and you know the Queen is a is a key figure and a very <laughs> pro Britain. Um, mentality within that club and fan base is something that does not go down well with Liverpool fans especially and you know should there, there, should there be a rendition of the so-called national anthem I'm sure that'll go down um, like a lead balloon should it even be attempted at Anfield um, but best of luck to, to all teams and you know any any people who are going up I'm sure there'll be a, a lot of people going up to Glasgow and a lot of people coming down from Glasgow with 
it'll create a good atmosphere. There'll be a lot of a lot of fun around both cities because I think what we have got, regardless of you know political agendas and you know uh, loyalist sort of views, we're, we're, we're two cities who are very much alike. The the mentality yeah. of the people is something that you know you, you can you can get on board with. They're they're a, they're a working class city. There's a lot of hardship in there that you know they they haven't been given an easy ride and you know they're, they're all the ties that you sort of associate with you know maybe big northern cities but you know if you were to compare say probably Edinburgh as Manchester and Liverpool as Glasgow um it was just yeah. nice to get, to get to get one of them and it whets the appetite and you know we are recording on one o'clock on a Friday afternoon and the draw was made at six o'clock first night and we're still none the wiser as to when we're going to play them, which is highly annoying. I'm sure in years gone by, draws were made and the fixtures were out within about two hours. Um, it just seems, you know, the cynic in me would suggest you wait for a, a boxing off the TV companies and the airlines with flights and dates of when certain countries are going to be demanding a lot of people to fly there or travel there. And the fans will be the last to know. And sadly, the fans will be the ones who've got to pay in the pocket as well as the uh, the time as well, which is it just isn't right. Well, you know, I'm afraid it's just something we've come to expect. At least you can get to Glasgow on the motorway and yeah, via the, via the trains. Should they be on? Um, that's a different kettle of fish. But uh, I think Amsterdam will have an influx of Liverpool fans. Napoli maybe not so much, but yeah, the old fame just whets the appetite and. There's a little bit of you know the Stephen Gerrard connection there and stuff, so I'm looking I mean, forward to it. I mean, at least I mean, I mean, the one thing you'd say about Glasgow very quickly as well is like it, it, the, the similarities. One of the reasons you can tell the similarities is that's why Kenny's fitted in so well when he came down here. And I think you're right. If you take all the sectarian stuff out of it, which I know, I know, I mean, I know it's fundamental to what goes on and, and all the rest of it. But if you take all that aside, it kind of is a kind of you know, a really, really great, well-loved team game, playing against a, another well-loved team that plays in blue. You know, it's like it's, there's so many similarities between the two cities and the way we are and the way the people are and how detached we feel from Westminster and all these other things that go into it. And it's going to it's going to be a celebration. As far as UEFA not sorting the dates out yet, to be honest, I'm still pleased they managed to actually get the draw and not have to redo it because I saw it on my phone last night because I was out and I thought, hey, I'm gone. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna think about this being the final draw. I'll give it half an hour and see whether they get another update saying that they've had to redraw the thing because they messed up. Um, you know, they've done well to actually get a draw through, haven't they? When you think about it, so difficult for them. Yeah, the, you know, they got a draw through, but that's probably because Man City got Dortmund and a nice, easy Scandinavian team, and not one of the big boys from Spain. And you know, Real Madrid got the usual Shakhtar. Barcelona got the usual Bayern Munich. Um, you know, Chelsea and Spurs were quite happy with their Europa League level group. So, you know, there was no need for a redraw, really. Um, I didn't see Man United in the draft for some reason. Also. <laughs> you just put the words on my mouth. I was just going to say that <laughs> the Europa League conference, Ryman's Vanarama draw, I think, is today or whatever. Um but no doubt they'll moan that they've got a harder group than, you know, Liverpool and Man City combined. And, you know, they're just so hard done to. But, yeah, the, the, the spoiled babies will always have something to moan about, won't they? But I, I just want to get involved with it now. And I think, as we are, it's it's Friday. It's a in between the Derby and Wolves, I think, is the first match day. So it's literally 10 days away, 11 days away that, you know, the famous Champions League anthem's back. And, all I hope is, you know, we have a better outcome this year on the pitch and off the pitch. And, you know, the, the finals held in Turkey, we've got very fond memories going back there. It would be very active, you know, 10 months down the line, come a very hot, sunny night in June, I think it is this year, in Turkey, that, that we're there again. And, you know, hopefully the situation's managed much better because we, we, we finished on a sour note last year, but we start on a little bit of a sound nose on the pitch this year, but you know, there's, there's cause for optimism and three games in, it's not all doom and gloom really. We should be okay. Yeah, I think we will be and we'll enjoy, we'll enjoy every single bit of it. Um, I think 
Personally, I think September, September next week, by the time you listen to this, it might be September. We might have th- that first win on the board by the time you listen to this. But in a lot of ways, football really gets going when people have gone, gone the game with the coats on. Because like, when you watch the game now, like Anfield looks red because no one's got a coat on. So everyone's wearing the red in red colours. And you see it all around the grounds. The, the sun's out. Everyone's wearing you know, shirt sleeves, whatever football shirt sleeves and everywhere looks red. I mean, football really gets going when the, the, the sort of stands are a little bit darker because everyone's wrapped up and, you know, you get those European nights under the floodlights and the you know, the cold European nights and all the rest of it. And you're behind your team, partly because you're behind your team and partly because it keeps you warm. I think, you know, this, this is when football really gets going and that, that to me starts properly in September. And that's, that's, um, that's where we are now. We've had, we've had a holiday, we've had a break, we've had the summer break, but, yeah, some of us haven't got going as quick as we should, including this show in a lot of ways. But you know what? We'll, we'll be here now. We're here now for the season. We'll have plenty more shows, plenty more to talk about. And win, lose, or draw, we'll be behind the team and we'll um, we'll we'll keep giving you a, a feel for what it's like out here, over here, up near the home of the best team in the world, whatever the league table says, whatever the any other records say. We are the best team in the world because everything about us is the best. And um, for now... Let's leave it at that, and we will see you again soon. Thanks for listening. Keep listening to Anfield Index. Keep listening out to Raw. Keep listening out to all the other great shows on this channel. And we will see you very soon. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.